You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Sometimes it happens accidentally, or someone thinks it would be fun to see the effects of a particular mm, substance on a pet. At times, pet owners with the best of intentions may give medications that have been effective for themselves or another pet, often with disastrous consequences. And then there is the inquisitive pet that tastes, touches, or trods in something that could be poisonous. How do you know when to call your veterinarian or pet poison control number? Did you even know there was a pet poison control organization? Today's guest, Dr. Justine Lee, knows the answers to these questions and more. She's a board-certified emergency critical care veterinarian and a diplomate of the American Board of Toxicology. We'll be right back after this short break. So sit, stay, listen. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. It's dinner time in America, where more pet parents trust PetSmart for natural and expert recommended foods than any place else. And now, we've added more than 100 new varieties to our already wide selection of your favorite brands, like Simply Nourish, Authority, Wellness, Science Diet, and more. Do what's best for your pet. At PetSmart, happiness in store. Go to PetSmartDeal.com to find out this week's coupon code and save up to 30% on food, treats, toys, and more. And get free shipping on orders of $49. Go to PetSmartDeal.com. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Justine Lee, thank you so much for being with us again. I love having you on the show. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Dr. Cruz. Well, here in the Western United States, now in other places in the United States too, marijuana, let's touch on that first. Marijuana has become legalized for medical use as well as also for recreational use. And I do have to admit that I know people who have thought it'd be kind of fun to blow some smoke into your pet's face and have that little contact high. Are we seeing problems with it? Because it seems people think marijuana is just so safe. You know, that's a great question. You know, in states where they've decriminalized marijuana for humans for medicinal purposes, they're actually seeing a fourfold increase in marijuana poisoning in dogs and actually a 30% increase in pediatric children less than two years Hmm. of age. So it definitely does pose a poisoning risk to both young children and pets. And this is mostly because of accidental food that's been laced with THC. Dogs don't know there's marijuana in that chocolate brownie and end up getting poisoned by both the marijuana and also the chocolate. I know there have been times where clients have brought in a pet that it looks stoned. You know, it's kind of wobbly on its feet. Its eyes are dilated. It just kind of, the lights are on, not everybody's home. And ask the question, could this pet have gotten into something Oh, no, not at all. And it's difficult sometimes for people to finally tell you, yes, it got into either my medicinal marijuana or it got into my stash. What are some of the signs besides that stone look? And should people be concerned with telling their veterinarian? I think they're concerned we're going to turn them in. Yeah, you know, when in doubt, veterinarians are only looking out for the uh, health of your dog 
or rarely your cat. And cats rarely get into marijuana, so it, it's less of an issue. I always recommend being honest. Veterinarians aren't out to report you. They're not going to report you to the police or the DEA. And honestly, the sooner you tell your veterinarian, the sooner we can figure out what's going on, the sooner we can treat your pet, and the better the outcome. When it comes to marijuana poisoning, the most common clinical signs that we can see are walking drunk, acting disoriented or stoned, having dilated pupils. Some dogs will actually do the opposite, where instead of being stoned and calm and quiet, they'll actually get really hyperactive and aggressive or agitated instead. Sometimes we can see tremors or even seizures. And despite its anti-vomiting or anti-nausea effect of marijuana, we actually see vomiting in about 30% of dogs that come in. Thankfully, it rarely is fatal. But it can cause a really life-threateningly slow heart rate, and it can make them breathe really slowly. So sometimes they actually need to be ventilated on a respirator. How common, or is it just dose-specific, or is it going to be the individual pet as to how they respond to marijuana? Because I know a lot of people are thinking, if medicinal marijuana helps me undergoing chemotherapy or I have various medical conditions, maybe it's going to help my pet. But first... How toxic is marijuana? Is there a LD50, that certain amount that, oh yes, this is going to be problematic? Because you said it wasn't that toxic for most pets. Well, Dr. Cruz, that's a great question. Unfortunately, we as toxicologists don't even know the quote-unquote toxic dose. It's definitely poisonous to dogs, but it's rarely fatal. And unfortunately, the toxic dose isn't actually known. And this is one of the reasons why we're hesitant to use medicinal marijuana in dogs and cats, because we don't even know the quote-unquote therapeutic dose. We know the toxic, the LD50, in other words, the fatal dose that kills 50% of dogs that gets into it, is about three grams per kg. That's a huge amount. That said, while your dog is less likely to quote unquote die from marijuana, they can definitely become symptomatic at really low doses. And again, this really confuses the issue on finding appropriate therapeutic dose to use in dogs and cats. I've been asked by many of my clients who themselves are using medicinal marijuana Aren't veterinarians doing research in this subject? It's helped me, or I have a friend who has been using it, and it's just been amazing. They're not getting the adverse side effects. They don't seem to be as prone to getting some of the the high signs that we would typically think of of a, a stoner on marijuana. Why is it that veterinary medicine does not seem to be investigating this? To the best of my knowledge, they don't seem to be investigating the use of marijuana. It's likely multifactorial. One, veterinarians are such scientists, it's really viewed as holistic care. And so a lot of times we'll try drugs such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or opioid-like pain medications in order to alleviate pain first, really strong anti-vomiting medications. So there's a lot of medicine that already is quote-unquote more traditional, but also has a lot more research behind it. B, the FDA probably doesn't want to spend a lot of money investigating the therapeutic dose of medicinal marijuana. So unless a company goes ahead and pays for the initial testing, unfortunately, the FDA probably won't initiate that testing on its own. Even in human medicine, the amount of money that's spent on medicinal marijuana testing is minimal compared to other big drugs like Lipitor, statins that decrease cholesterol, antidepressants, and other more quote-unquote profitable drugs for veterinary or human pharmaceutical companies. So unfortunately, there's just not a lot of research in it. Well, I know some people think that it's holistic, it's natural, it's not going to be problematic, but yes, thank you very much for addressing that right off the bat, because I know there's so many questions that are revolving around this particular subject. You brought up earlier the fact that sometimes dogs, because dogs love to eat first, think later, will get into the marijuana because it was in a brownie, it was in some type of food material. What are some of the other real food poisoning issues that we're seeing with dogs? Because again, cats don't seem to be as apt for getting into things they shouldn't. 
Well, the first thing related to marijuana is when people actually will boil THC with butter. And so we'll see a lot of butter that's been laced with THC. And this is actually the most dangerous type because it's a really fatty type of oil. And unfortunately, there's been reports of fatalities of dogs dying getting into marijuana butter. So any kind of baked good, you definitely want to keep out of reach, especially if it's been laced with something like medicinal marijuana. In terms of other food poisonings, and this is especially important as the seasons approach, we have more and more food out, you know, we're leaving things on counters. And while everyone knows about chocolate poisoning, thankfully, it's rarely poisonous just because it takes a large amount of chocolate, for the most part, to poison a dog. That said, a lot of people forget about other types of food poisonings, like grapes, raisins, and even certain types of currants. These can cause kidney failure in dogs when they get into it. Things like macadamia nuts. Most parents don't think about, you know, when they come back from Hawaii, they bring back chocolate-covered macadamia nuts from vacation. If their dog gets into it, not only is it chocolate poisonous, but we can actually see macadamia nuts causing a temporary paralysis where your dog can't walk from getting into nuts. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing because you're saying, yes, is the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas coming. There are always those dogs that you have the box of candy that's wrapped. You got it from a friend or you're going to be giving it away as a present. It's under the tree. And dog noses are amazing. They can smell through all that. And you come home and, you know, here's the wrapping. Here's, you know, the foil covering. But all the chocolate's gone. That's right. When in doubt, don't put any kind of food-related product under the tray. (laughs) You know, whether or not it's dried meats, salami, espresso, chocolate-covered espresso beans, chocolate. These are all super dangerous to dogs. When in doubt, just put them in a closet. And then you forget about them going, oh, dang, I forgot to take that and give it to (laughs) so-and-so. Yes. So you're mentioning sausages. So yes, they smell that. But even eating something like sausage, if they were to eat this whole roll of it, that can really upset their stomach. Might not kill them, but that could be a horrible case of diarrhea. You're right. It's not quote unquote poisonous per se, but certain fatty foods like meat scraps. So, you know, the gristle, the fat from turkey skin, or even the gravy, this can really inflame the pancreas. It's what we call pancreatitis. And certain breeds are especially sensitive to pancreatitis. So Yorkshire Terriers, Shetland Sheepdogs, and Miniature Schnauzers, they should never, ever get any kind of fattening food or table scraps. If you want to give your dog something as a little snack for the holidays, you can definitely give a small piece of lean meat. So like a piece of turkey breast, that's okay in moderation. But again, fattening foods, absolutely big no-no around the holidays. Something I think I'd love to have you address because so many people will come in, you know, every holiday seems to have uh, certain icons. So Christmas, we think of poinsettias and everyone goes, oh, yes, poinsettias are poisonous. I can't have them around my pet. And then comes Easter. We have these Easter lilies and everyone goes, oh, that's fine. Please address that. Sure. Thanks for bringing it up because it's a really important factor that a lot of pet owners forget about. Poinsettias are barely poisonous. In fact, I have them in my house with one dog and two cats during the holidays, and I'm okay with it. Poinsettia is basically, if you've ever crushed the leaf or bent the leaf, they have this white milky sap. It's just an irritant. It's going to cause some vomiting. It might cause some drooling. It might cause some diarrhea, but really not going to be that poisonous of a plant. So huge myth that we want to debunk. Poinsettias are barely poisonous. The bigger danger to cats are actually lilies. So true lilies in the Lilium or Hemerocallis species. So this is anything like an Easter lily, Asiatic, Japanese show lily, Oriental lily, day lily. You don't even want to bring these into your house if you have cats. And that's because two or three leaves or even the pollen or even the water from the vase can cause severe kidney failure. So if you're not a botanist and you can't recognize plants in a bouquet, don't bring them into your house. Again, call the florist, verify there aren't any lilies in it, check with a veterinarian, check with an animal poison control. But when in doubt, lilies are super poisonous. For dogs, we worry about sago palm, and Mm. these are often a little bonsai household plant. In the southeast or southwest United States, they grow up into huge palms outside, but if you're not sure if it's a sago palm and it looks palmy, 
Don't bring it into the house. Again, this is actually a really dangerous, life-threatening poisoning in dogs. In fact, 50% of dogs who get into sacral palm die or are euthanized. So again, it causes severe liver failure. Don't bring a plant into the house unless you're 100% sure it's not poisonous. Uh, You were mentioning even the water from a lily plant can be toxic to your cat. People oftentimes will ask about the water in a Christmas tree. You know, on the bottom, the pet goes, oh, thank you so much. You brought in a organic hydrant for me, number one for dogs or cats. Think it's fun to climb to the top, but also, oh, there's water. And thank you, I have a new water bowl. Is that water toxic? You know, it's a little bit poisonous. When in doubt, some people will actually add a little bit of fungicide in there to prevent fungus from growing in there. It's not going to be a huge deal. When in doubt, I always recommend just wrapping it with aluminum foil. That way your dog or your cat's not even tempted to get into that area. We still want you to water your Christmas tree, but again, not going to be too poisonous. It can cause a little bit of vomiting and diarrhea, but nobody wants to visit an emergency room on Christmas Day. So do yourself a favor and again, just make sure it's covered. Or a good reason to have an artificial tree. Exactly. At Christmas time, everybody knows what packages come from my house because none of them have ribbons. I have three cats. And if there's any type of a ribbon or a bow, they will sit there and chew on this. And I am always just so freaked out that they're going to swallow this and I will have to then take my cat to the emergency clinic or I will have to do surgery to get this out. Our foreign bodies, linear foreign bodies, things like string. Is it a problem for other animals? I've seen a couple, but it seems like, oh, my cats are just notorious for trying to chew on it. Great question, Dr. Cruz. You know, while cats rarely get into poisons, in fact, probably about 10% of the calls to ASPCA animal poison control are cats. We always worry about anything stringy or anything like ribbon or yarn. And while it's not poisonous, it is extremely dangerous to cats. Cats are so curious. So they want to play with it, bat it around, they'll end up eating it. And so that string of ribbon becomes a huge issue because it can actually wrap around the base of their tongue while they're chewing on it. And as they swallow it, The more their stomach contracts, the more their intestines contract, that string or yarn can actually saw through their intestines, resulting in what we call a septic peritonitis, a severe infection into their abdomen. It's going to cost two to three thousand dollars, if not more, to surgically fix. So, when in doubt, dental floss, yarn, string, ribbon, tinsel on a Christmas tree, huge no no. Anything stringy, do not bring it into a household with cats. Best thing to do, attach your tree to the wall so it doesn't fall down. And especially if you have kittens, put all your decorations way up high so the pet can't get into it. Dr. Justine Lee is who am I chatting with right now. She's a board-certified emergency critical care veterinarian and a diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology. We're going to be right back after this short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. 
Hi, this is T.O.D. Anderson, and I'm the host of Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. We're going to talk about a variety of topics on canine behavior and training, all based on modern methods that are fun for you and your dog. We might be talking about other critters, too. So join us on Get Positive Results. We'll talk about common issues between you and your dog, answer your questions, discuss different activities you can do with your dog, and keep you posted on current canine news and products. All this on Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Lee, right before the break, you had mentioned the ASPCA Poison Control. Please give us a number. Tell us more about this group. When in doubt, I always say if you're worried that your dog or your cat is poisoned, call your veterinarian, an emergency veterinarian, or ASPCA Animal Poison Control at 888 888- 426-4435. I actually pre-program my cell phone with this number because in case of an emergency, you're too frazzled to look it up online, just automatically have it pre-programmed into your phone. And the benefit is they're available 24-7. So if you can't get in touch with your veterinarian, you can call for life-saving advice to find out if your dog or your cat got into something poisonous. The best thing about it is sometimes they're able to figure out whether or not it was a toxic dose and give you advice on whether or not to induce vomiting or not. And sometimes you can avoid that costly visit to an emergency room if you find out that you can treat your dog at home. When it comes to poisoning cases, the important thing to remember is the sooner you identify the poisoning, the sooner you call or seek veterinary attention, the better the outcome. You don't want to wait until your pet's already shown clinical signs. Now it's really expensive to treat. So when in doubt, call right away. Excellent, excellent information. Thank you so much. And you're right. There are times you are just so frazzled, you can't think straight. And there have been numerous times when clients have brought in a pet to me going, gee, it ate this. I'm not really sure if it's poisonous. And I'm looking through my paperwork going, you know, I can't tell, especially if it's a human medication. I don't know how much might be toxic. So I'll get on the phone to the ASPCA and say, all right, this is the size of the pet. This is how much it got into. What do I need to do and get fabulous information from you? There are other times that I have, because I want people to be aware of potential toxins that are out there. And I've been given these various forms and sheets, handouts that say, oh, you have to make sure your pet stays away from poinsettias. We talked about that one. And then things like avocados. Avocados are on there. And to the best of my knowledge, that's not really a problem. Could you kind of debunk some of the mythology that's out there of what is and is not toxic to pets? Sure. That's actually one of my biggest pet peeves when people disseminate the wrong information and it goes viral on the internet. So when in doubt, I always say, especially if you do a lot of social media, you want to make sure that the information that you're disseminating for pet owners or for fellow veterinary colleagues is accurate, that you've nailed the two biggest myths out there. Poinsettias, honestly, they're barely poisonous. They're totally fine to have in your house. They're going to cause a little bit of vomiting. But when in doubt, just keep all plants out of reach and keep them elevated. Avocados are not poisonous to dogs. The reason why that myth probably got started is because when it comes to different species like birds or goats, sheep or ruminants, avocados are extremely poisonous to birds. Hmm. One or two pieces can result in severe pulmonary edema or fluid accumulation in their lungs. This also happens in ruminants. So again, goats, sheep, things like that. But again, totally safe for dogs. In fact, in California, a lot of dogs that live on farms of avocado farms, they eat avocados all the time. They love it. (laughs) They love it. So not going to be a big deal. The bigger thing that we worry about with avocados is that big seed in the middle. It ends up potentially getting stuck in their stomach if a dog wolfed it down all at once and swallowed it whole. And that can actually result in a foreign body that requires surgery to get out or even emesis induction, inducing vomiting. So when in doubt, make sure the seed is out of reach. But for the most part, if your dog gets into a little bit of guacamole, not going to be a big deal at all. The third myth I wanted to mention is a lot of people will say, you know, prescription medications or over-the-counter medications that they use must be safe for humans. So it's safe for dogs or cats. 
And remember, dogs and cats have a totally different metabolism. One Tylenol will kill a cat. So when in doubt, even over-the-counter medications, even some supplements can be really poisonous to dogs and cats. So, you know, you don't want to rely on just because it's safe for me, it's safe for my dog or cat. That is not true at all. What are some of the common yard toxins? You get outside and you have you want to have these gorgeous plants, so you put down blood meal or you put down fertilizer. And many times the dogs are attracted to it. The cats go, mm, this smells so good. Or even things like the cocoa shells that they'll use for landscaping. Are those types of things toxic? Great question again. I would say my general advice is while I love to keep my dog outside, you know, in his fenced in yard while I'm gardening, the safest thing you can do is actually keep them locked in the house while you're doing gardening and keep them out of the garage. And that's because there are a lot of poisons in the garage, yard, or garden. So you bring up a couple of great points. A lot of pet owners are trying to be organic to keep their pets safer. And it's actually organic fertilizers that are more dangerous than regular fertilizers. Amazing. Yeah, organic fertilizer basically crushed up dead things, which sounds gross. (laughs) But, you know, blood meal is basically dehydrated blood from the food industry. So probably from, from cattle. Poultry meal or feather meal is leftover feathers from the poultry industry. Fish meal, gross parts of fish that we don't eat or use, um, those are you know basically pulverized. And all of these are great natural nitrogen sources, but they smell disgusting, so they taste great to Labradors. So you know <laughs> when you mix it in the soil, it smells really palatable to dogs, so they're going to eat a large amount, and it can cause a severe pancreatitis, can cause a foreign body in the stomach too. So when in doubt, if you're going to put fertilizer down, make sure to water it or fence off that area so your dog or your cat can't get into it. Another important one, especially during this time of the year, is mouse and rat poison. Mm. If you have any pets in your house, I'm not an advocate of using any type of poison at all. And the main reason why is it also poisons our wildlife. It's one of the top killers of raptors or birds of prey. So instead, it's actually more humane to use snap traps. Keep them in your garage. Keep them in a fenced-in area where your dog or cat can't get into them. But, you know, a lot of people are worried as fall approaches about mice and rats running into their house. Again, try to avoid using any poisons at all and make sure to keep these completely out of reach. And I think it's so important that if perchance you, boy, I put it out last year. I totally forgot that I had put some rat bait behind the washing machine. There was no way, oh, my pet did get into it, that you take that particular product with you. If you still have it, bring the box, bring whatever with you, because there are different types of rodenticides, some easier to treat than others. Could you kind of address that as to the various types that are out there right now? Great point. Absolutely. So one of the important things that you just mentioned is, again, definitely bring that tray that contains the rat poison or the original box, because that provides a lot of information about what type of active ingredient is in that mouse and rat poison. Another important thing is there's a 24-7-1-800 number on these containers, and you can call for life-saving advice for humans that are exposed or animals that are exposed. So again, a great way of being able to get free advice 24 hours a day in case you think your dog got into it. So make sure you always keep that original box. Now, back in May of this year, the EPA actually made this law or this mandate where they mandated that Reckitt Ben Kieser, one of the biggest makers of the company Decon, eliminate 12 major types of rat poison, which are under the brand name Decon. This was frustrating for veterinarians because Decon is the only type of mouse and rat poison that has an antidote that's really easy to treat. Unfortunately, with this new EPA change, we're going to be seeing less types of mouse and rat poison that cause internal bleeding that can be treated with vitamin K. And instead, we're going to see two types of mouse and rat poison that are even more deadly, that don't have an antidote. One of them is called bromethylene that causes tremors and seizures. And the second type is called cholecalciferol, and it's basically vitamin D. 
So the same vitamin that we take in a really concentrated form that basically causes a really high calcium level in the body and causes severe kidney failure. And so even though this EPA mandate was designed to help protect wildlife, unfortunately, now it's actually increased two types of ingredients that are more deadly and more dangerous to dogs and cats. So when in doubt, again, I'm a huge advocate. Don't buy any of these poisons. Don't use any of them. I actually think it's inhumane for mice and rats to die that way too. So when in doubt, use more humane snap traps instead. It's so difficult. And I know the government sometimes has the best of intentions and it doesn't always work out that way. There are so many, you'd mentioned Tylenol, that one Tylenol can kill a cat. There are so many different medications, substances, salves that we use on ourselves that many times you don't even think that may be problematic for your dog or cat coming into contact with. I'll always remember I had this just charming, itty-bitty little young, it was a kind of a miniature Yorkshire Terrier, the cutest small thing in the world, and it was always in mom's arms. And she brought it in, and it was probably about two, four months of age or so. It had a very swollen vulva. It looked like it was in heat. It had swollen mammary glands. It's like, wow, this must be one of the most precocious little puppies in the entire world if it's coming into heat at this point. So we thought, all right, things happen. Went ahead and spayed it. Everything inside basically looked normal. But then the enlarged mammary glands persisted. And it was just like, there's something going on here. Started asking more and more questions to the owner and found out that she was using estrogen creams, applying it to her arms. And as this pup was always in her arms, being exposed to this estrogen and seeing these secondary changes. Are there other medications like this? Because now so many things are being applied topically. Are you seeing other problems like this as a toxicologist? Yes. And you bring up such a great point because most people don't even think about topical toxins. So the estrogen creams, you know, some types of chemotherapeutic creams that are used for skin cancer, they're often called 5-FU or 5-fluorouracil. One tube, one one ounce tube will kill a 70 to 80 pound dog. Oh and most, goodness. Yeah, most people think they're benign because they're just smearing them on their skin. But if your dog licks it chronically off of you, or if your dog gets into the tube itself, again, it can be a huge poison and concern. So the two biggest topical creams that I worry about that are life-threatening, again, chemotherapy medication that's used for basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And a second cream that's used for psoriasis, and that's called calcipatrine. And that is very, very similar to that vitamin D mouse and rat poison. Again, one one ounce tube will kill an 80 pound dog. So we want to make sure to always keep these topical creams out of reach. Some topical ointments are really safe. So triple antibiotic ointment or cortisone cream or, you know, baby diaper rash cream. Those aren't a big deal. But again, prescription topical medications can be deadly to dogs and even cats. Cats, thankfully, don't lick too much of it. But again, something we worry about more in dogs than in cats. I'd mentioned the estrogen cream. Now men are using testosterone creams. And I love the commercials because it's supposed to be applied to the underarm. And then women and children are not supposed to be exposed to that area. It's like, I don't know how many people actually snuggle under the arms, but I guess children can snuggle up to dad or whomever. Are testosterone creams also problematic for dogs and cats? You know, I actually haven't seen any testosterone, quote unquote, poisonings in dogs and cats. And thankfully, hopefully it means it's because people are applying it correctly. But when in doubt, I always caution about using any of those creams, especially with children or pets involved. So no, I haven't seen that. I've definitely seen the estrogen creams, which seem to be more popular. So maybe nobody's admitting to using testosterone creams. (laughs) (laughs) I don't need Viagra and I don't need testosterone cream. I see that. Okay, fine. There was a situation with several years ago where a client, I'm surrounded, my practice is surrounded by a a large population of senior citizens. And as we mature, we have our, our share of various medical issues. This particular person had a cardiac issue and needed to use nitroglycerin. Oh, yes. And nitroglycerin cream. 
And this one morning, I guess they were kind of sleepy and got out their tube of toothpaste and started brushing their teeth. But alas, it wasn't their crest. It was their nitroglycerin (laughs) cream and had a problem. Are there medications like that that are, or I should ask, what are some of the most common prescription medications that people are taking that pets are being exposed to and causing problems? Great question. So the top prescription drug poisonings that I see in dogs and in cats are one, cardiac medications, two, antidepressants, and three, ADD medications. So if you're on any of those top three drugs, you have to make sure you keep them out of reach of dogs and cats. When it comes to cardiac medications, the most dangerous is actually when people put all their medication in one of those weekly pill holders, A, That sounds like a dog rattle, right? So dogs will Mm -hmm. chew into it. It looks like a plastic toy they can chew into. But B, a lot of pet owners don't even remember what medications they put in there. So sometimes there's an aspirin, a fish oil, anti-hypertension medication. Sometimes there's a cholesterol medication, a platelet medication. And some of these cardiac medications can be really, really dangerous to dogs and cats. They can basically make the heart rate too slow. They can drop the blood pressure to a life threateningly low blood pressure. And very rarely, they can go into kidney failure from having such a low blood pressure. So when in doubt, you want to keep those weekly pill holders out of reach. For the other prescription medications like antidepressants, these are common brand names like Effexor or, you know, Cymbalta. These medications like Prozac, when in doubt, safe for humans, sometimes used in veterinary medicine for behavioral problems in dogs and cats at very low doses. But if a dog gets into a whole bottle or a cat gets into one pill or one capsule for a human size, it can definitely result in severe poisoning. Thankfully, it's rarely fatal, but it can cause dilated pupils, a racing heart rate, really severe hypertension, a high blood pressure, or even tremors and seizures. The third medication are ADD or ADHD medications, which are basically amphetamines. And these show really similar clinical signs to antidepressants when dogs and cats get into them. So they're basically uppers. They make the heart rate too fast, the blood pressure too fast. They can tremor or seizure. So when in doubt, my three little tips for pet-proofing your house is one, crate train your dog, especially if you have a Labrador. (laughs) <laughs> Two, making sure to keep your prescription medications out of reach. So keeping them in the bathroom cabinet or keeping them in a kitchen drawer that's away from the dog medication so they're not accidentally confused when you're pilling your dog or cat. And three, simple things like hanging up your purse or your backpack. There's a lot of poisonous things that are in a purse or backpack. Raisins, prescription medications, cell phone batteries, coins, you know, birth control pills. So again, simply doing those three things and then maybe add on keeping that weekly pill holder out of reach are easy ways for us to be able to pet proof our house so our dogs or cats aren't accidentally exposed. Dr. Justine Lee, I mean, we could go on for hours. You have such wonderful information. It totally makes sense. And yes, there are times when people will accidentally take pet medications. So besides having their poison control number for themselves, if you could repeat the ASPCA's poison control number, that was very helpful. Absolutely. ASPCA animal poison control can be reached at 888-426-4435. When in doubt, I always recommend pre-programming your cell phone or literally just writing that number and putting it on your refrigerator so you have it in case of emergency. Great ideas. Dr. Justine Lee, thank you so much. Hopefully people won't be needing that service, but I know they will. This has been Dr. Bernadine Cruz on The Pet Doctor. You've been listening to us, hopefully learning a little bit of something. If there's anything that interests you, please drop us a line, let us know, and we can have our next show be on that topic. So have yourself a fantastic week. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.